Yeah, I'm just waiting for your information. And I want to share, I'll start. Let me just do it super quick. Um. One second has taken me a while. Um, I guess in the meantime, Sanjay, you, um, you're welcome to just introduce yourself, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. provide a little background on what you do um, with Youth Private Welfare, for example, or any other projects you're working on. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, hello, everyone on the phone. Uh, I'm Dick from Nepal. Uh, I'm I'm the youth uh, landscape uh, activist. Uh, I've done uh, little things in landscape for the landscape restoration uh, project, like uh, in the climate change issues, and um, in the and for, like for the um, working with the teams, survivor victims, and and different campaigns related to youth empowerment in. And uh, call it periphery, and I have. I'm also the founder of an NGO called Paila Paila. Paila in means first step. Uh, this was named um, after we conducted donation for Nepal campaign and during the last catastrophic 7.9 magnitude earthquake in Nepal in recent um, April, and there was a uh, like. Uh, 10 billion US dollars lost in Nepal with the troll of uh, 9,000 people. And we thought we could do, we, we should do something. And some of the, my network started a uh, campaign by conducting um, uh, account in GoFundMe.com. And by then we got overwhelming support from everyone. Like we were really connected to the people, uh, and they were like coming to us, seeing our work, seeing the way we're connecting volunteers, working in ground levels, uh, and, we, and there was really effective as well. And we were able to conduct thirty thousand US dollar donation within a month, and we reached to the eleven villages uh, with like uh, fifty five hundred people. So we. 500 peoples, and we also made some of the temporary shelters around the outskirts of the Kathmandu Valley and a solid school in one of the very rural part of Nepal, Kalang. Uh, it's one of the touristic destinations as well. It was epic center and highly destroyed. There was no means of education for the children, and they were on the tarps and staring in the tarps in the sun. So we went there and we built one um, one school there. And there was uh, there was also flood and landslide in one of the. Nepal Sunkosi uh, district from Sindhupalchok and we conducted fundraising campaign there also and we went there we helped people and I was leading this project and another workshop and really, uh, to two different schools uh, children about the climate change issues and different ways to mitigate those issues from our ground level um, like small, like uh, instead of using fountain pen, we can use ink pen and save some carbon there and some recycling approach at the school level and uh, planting trees and using paper bags instead of plastic bags. And the uh, students' mass is like 600 plus in two different schools. And and it is going really effective and today I'm traveling back to my place and I'm really excited for the for this workshop as well. And 
what I think uh, for the effectiveness of camp for every youth, not like me, uh, who are on the phone, uh, everyone, this one is effective communication. Mm, uh, if we can communicate with the people, right people, uh, and effectively, it makes really a good impression. Uh, like I said, our donation Nepal campaign was success, uh, big success, just because of effective communication. We conduct, you created account, this was just a social media in Facebook. Um, we were like communicating with the people, we were able to approach the right masses to them. And another is people from different backgrounds. If you have the people from different backgrounds in our campaign, it will be really helpful for us to get different perspectives from each other and yeah, to share ideas and to the bar that one has. So the people from different backgrounds is one of the uh, important factors for the success of every um, campaign. And yeah. Guys, are you hearing me? And another is division of labor. No one can do everything alone. So if we can divide work and if we can work with different peoples, like in our campaign, I was, is, I'm a passionate traveler. So in our campaign, mostly I take the part of traveling, like going there, going here. And some of my friends are IT experts. Some of my friends are communication experts. Uh, and they, they take that part. Uh, so division of labor is an, another important part. And another is effective social media. These days, yeah, social media has really important role. Um, and we can do many things just, um, just, just, like, just like many things in social media. Uh, one, one of the examples is Donation for Nepal Camp and the Sunkosi fundraising campaign as well as also success because of uh, social media. We can show them what we are doing and try to approach the right people to get the, uh, to get the right appreciation that may be by helping funds or that may be by um, wars. And yeah, important and accessible. Uh, for the organization, easy, 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 like hashtagging campaign, which is really effective. And we have here a story, and his, his name is um, Hiralal um, Nopane. He's from one of the rural part of Nepal. And I do I his story because I have never paralytic superhero because he indeed is a superhero. I have mm, the travel like one to two days from the road to reach his home and he doesn't have a leg. And even his wife also has no hands. Like she has one hand, but she doesn't have one another hand. Mm, and they were doing incredible uh, the, the mushroom farming that you can see in the photo and another is that pond is that they are collecting water because they don't have water in their village this is the rainwater harvesting and another is coffee farming the small um, they're, they're the seedlings of coffee and they don't have proper market as well but he's a superhero he has been um, continuously working he's not giving up and uh, i'm trying to r reach to the right people in nepal to help him let's see what i can do further and and yeah blogging yeah uh, share my blog with uh sarah i think she had already shared with the uh, uh participant and yeah outcome happiness nothing more if we can help people, happiness. And I suggest everyone, uh, everyone of the people who are in line is do not forget to get afraid of making mistake because this is, is, is of exploring. Go out, explore, learn. Make mistake and learn from them. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I, I wish I could give all my time, but um, I have to travel to my university today. So it's early. 6 a.m. here in Nepal. And uh, thank you for inviting me, Julian. And Pedro, thank you so much. Thank you Anything? so much, Sanjay.
Anything you want to hear? Um, well, we don't want to hold you up, um, but thank you again for sharing um, your presentation. It was really, really enjoyable and meaningful and informative. Um, and I'm excited to share this recording with those who weren't able to be on the call. Um, and I guess safe travels to your university. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Feel free to join at any time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just right, trying so to. I think I'll, I'll go ahead yeah. and take. Um, yeah, yeah. If you want to stay, feel free to stay. If you have to go, I completely understand. I'm going to send my PowerPoint right now. It just went to everybody. Um, and I'm going to share the screen. So, okay, one second. I'm still trying to understand how to share screen. See you soon. Okay, everybody can hear me? This is not your head. No, this is not the beginning. Okay. Can everybody see the screen though? All right, so as we are having our Thanksgiving um, Thursday, we decided that the uh, ideal topic for this discussion would be agricultural emissions, just to see how we are in a way, polluting our cities by eating turkey, in a way. Um, it is not our fault. It is not our fault. We're just eating. We're meaning to do that to survive. However, um, it's good for us, for us to know what goes behind the scenes uh, when it comes to the environment. So, okay, uh, before I get started uh, on emissions, I would like to talk about the different types of agriculture uh, and what agriculture is as a whole. So, what is agriculture? It is the science, art, or occupation concerned with cultivating land, raising crops, and feeding, breeding, and raising livestock. In, in other words, farming. Uh, agriculture is very different depending where in the world you are. Uh, here in the United States, we have a lot of conventional agriculture, and I'll explain what that is in a bit. But then in many um, other countries, uh, especially lower income countries, they have more what it's called agro. Uh, Agroagriculture, I think it's called. Let's say it is called. Oh, sustainable agriculture, organic. Yeah, agroecology. I apologize. It's called agroecology, and uh, what that is is basically organic um, agriculture. Uh, so, as I previously mentioned, um, conventional agriculture is what we use in the states and also Europe. And the reason why we use this conventional agriculture is because it's it basically produces a lot of food with little um, money and effort. So it's very, um, it's very desired in our society because we're a fast moving society and we want food fast. We want a lot of portion, especially in America, we like our portions to be big. Um, so this is the ideal, um, not ideal, I'd say, what produces the amount, amount of food. Um, so what this is, this agriculture is, um, or what it does, it alters and changes the natural environment, such as removing trees, uh, moving the soil, installing irrigation systems, uh, because usually a lot of agriculture isn't in a place where they have water, and the, such, a, such is the case of California. So there's a lot of lines of water, irrigation systems that are being built. Um, there's a lot of monocropping being done. Uh, if you go driving in the Central Valley here in California, you will see miles and miles of almond, uh, almond trees or miles of orange trees here in Riverside. So it's just one monocrop. Uh, they're non-renewable. So I mean, after you are done um, harvesting that crop, usually the, the soil is removed from all the nutrients because the, the plants have eaten them. Uh, there is no diversity, and therefore there is not a you know, uh, there's not an uniformity, uh, ecological uniformity, and there's a lot of insecticides and pesticides that are used to keep the animals and the bugs basically away from uh, the plants. 
so that they grow faster and healthier, healthier, um, and we eat them. The issue with these pesticides is that they pollute, especially the water, and they also pollute the air in many ways. Some pesticides are good or they're not, I guess, bad for our health in low concentrations, and some other pesticides are not good for us or might be bad for aquatic life. Um, yeah, there's a lot of inorganic fertilizer and there is a lot of energy input into this um, type of agriculture because you need the energy, you need the water, you need um, all of that to, to grow plants this way. And I'm just talking mainly about crops. I'm not talking about animals, but animals also apply to this. So what are the effects of uh, conventional agriculture? Well, mainly... Um, since the plot is stripped, uh, the plants are vulnerable to disease, a lot of herbivore predation and soil erosion. When there's a lot of soil, soil erosion, there's a lot of dust that is being left up. And also an issue that we have in Spain is that um, as the soil erodes, you can't plant anything else in that soil. So that uh, the desertification in, gets enhanced in those areas where conventional agriculture is implemented. Um, and then there's a decrease in biodiversity, as I previously mentioned, and all the use of insecticide and pesticides pollute uh, the rivers. And usually, this is interesting, I didn't know about this, but apparently they cause, they cause severe economic hardship for the farmer, even when the consumer, because uh, sometimes it might be pests uh, that you know, get rid of all of, of a specific crop, so since that farmer only has a specific crop, there's a lot of economical loss and hardship from the farmer. But then on the other side, there is sustainable agriculture, which uses very different uh, principles. And this is usually the agriculture that is being used in developing countries, mainly because they don't have the, the resources, the energy, uh, they don't, pesticides and seem to be kind of expensive, so they don't have access to that either. And what, Sustainable agriculture or agro agriculture, what it does is um, maintain a natural environment and you use nature in a way to grow your own crops. Uh, you plant many crops together and that way you create biodiversity so you don't destroy the soil. And uh, since many plants are planted together, there's a different, you know, uh, this, at this time of the year we're harvesting this one, this time of year we're harvesting this one. So it's a constant flow of, I guess, goodies that you get versus just monocropping. Um, and then if there is, I guess, a lot of animals that um, go and eat these plants, since there's so many plants that herbivores might eat one specific plant, but used to have the others. Um, and then, yeah, basically it's, it's a lot cheaper. There's less, less energy required. And basically, as you can tell, there is uh, increases biodiversity. It doesn't pollute as much. Um, it adds an offer to the soil. It's able to sustain itself without a lot of effort and without destroying the soil. And there is less or no economic loss. So the question is, which one do you think pollutes more air-wise? If it's conventional, do I see? If it's um, uh, sustainable agriculture, I guess, do, do a triangle or something. So C or triangle? I just, conventional, conventional, everybody's voting conventional. <laughs> okay, Reina's voting conventional. So yeah, it is conventional. So, and what do you think? Do you think, so I talked about crops mainly. You think there is a, a pollution that comes from animals or is it just crops? Yeah, so yay or nay, how do you pollute? Are there pollution from animals? The answer is, yes, there's mucho pollution. <laughs> um, how they would say here in the Central Valley, because a lot of people that work in agriculture are usually immigrants from Mexico or they speak Spanish. There's, a, there's mucho pollution. And where does that mucho pollution come from? It comes from their poop. Um, and that poop, I'll get into specifics later on. But it is very polluting. Um, it is not polluting if it's, again, in high concentrations. But if it's in very heavy 
uh, amount of concentrations because of conventional agriculture that it pollutes both the water, the air, the soil, and basically the whole environment. So let's look a little bit more about on the specific and what type of agriculture pollutes more than, oh, I guess so. So what, let's look at the specific of the different types of agriculture and what each type of agriculture uh, emits in the atmosphere. So we have uh, the biomass burning that emits CO2. And it's, as you guys know, CO2 is a warming gas. Uh, that same burning emits uh, methane, which is CH4, and NOx. And NOx, as I previously mentioned in the other forums, is the main cause of smog um, because NOx turns into ozone through photocatalytic conversion. Um, there's also, also nitrous oxides from the manure. And uh, the cow poop has a lot of methane, which uh, um, Sarah will later talk about. And um, yeah, the fertilizers also um, have a lot of nitrogen and uh, which the soil respiration causes more CO2. And yeah, so this is basically, for those that don't have a view of the screen, open the PowerPoint. It's a very good diagram of what emits what. Um, and then uh, as a global food system, the fertilizer manufactured to food storage and packaging is responsible for one third of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions. So this, it was thought at one point that the main source of greenhouse emissions were cars and power plants, and they are, they're, they're still very big, and, but not a lot of emphasis was given to agriculture, but it's one third of human caused greenhouse gas emissions, which is, it might not necessarily affect health directly, but um, it is a lot. So when we look at it, this is just CO2. Um, when we look at the CO2 emissions, 40% of the 5.3 billion tons of CO2 that were emitted in just 2011. And I can, that's a lot of, of CO2. But 40% of that was from enteric fermentation. 16% was from manure left on uh, pasture, so left uh, in the middle of the field. 13% was from synthetic fertilizers. 10% from paddy rice. 7% from manure management. And 5% from burning the savannas, or I guess the fields. It was thought at one point that the main source of pollution from agriculture was from burning. But if you look at this, it's actually the least. Um, and cows <laughs> are the uh, largest. And animal, especially animal agriculture, this also includes um, pork, it includes chicken, um, all the animals that are raised in the farm is responsible for eight to 10 of global greenhouse gas emissions assessed by the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and it is, the contribution of livestock is up to 18% of global emissions. That's livestock though. So livestock is largest emissions. Uh, in two reports published, not today, um, but previously, I got this from an article, uh, the agriculture, I forget what that stands for, but I will let you guys know. Uh, it's an, I cannot believe I didn't include it, but it's basically an association that looks, association that does research on agriculture. Um, it says that reducing agriculture's carbon footprint is central to limiting climate change, and it should be a priority as, you know, the big climate summit is happening in, um, in Paris next month, this should be agriculture should be a big that uh, milestone to address during this meeting, and it doesn't just affect climate. You need to address this to ensure food security, farmers, and economical basis, and at the same time not destroying the planet or people because they do affect health in a way, and I'll explain it. Soon. Um, so there's different ways to reduce um, 
the, to reduce the emissions from uh, the agricultural sector. For example, for land and crop management, honestly, honestly, what needs to happen is a um, agricultural revolution, which in a way it's already happening with Whole Foods and you know all the organic stuff being consumed in the stores. But the management, the way agriculture is managed, especially in um, developed countries, needs to change. So a way of that would be adjusting the methods for managing land and growing crops. For example, fertilizing crops with a precise amount uh, of fertilizer. Sometimes farmers just put a bunch of fertilizer on the plants that, are, that isn't needed. So there needs to be a specific amount that they're allowed to put on there. Uh, draining the wetland, for example, because interestingly enough, even though the main, the main source of methane comes from cows, rice, um, rice fields actually emit a lot of methane as well. Does anybody know, those that are on your phone or on the, on the call, does anybody know how rice fields um, create methane? Anybody could answer? No, no. Who else is on here? A lot of phone numbers. Oh, Alyssa, you're, I can see you now. <laughs> Nobody knows how the rice fields emit methane? All right, so uh, methane, Alyssa, you should know this. You're, you're an environmental engineer. <laughs> how uh, in anaerobic digestion, sounds familiar, like the Matsumoto's class. So basically methane, oh. Sorry, methane is, um, is produced through anaerobic digestion. So there is microbes or bacteria that needs oxygen to digest um, organics, and then there is bacteria that don't need oxygen. So the bacteria that doesn't need oxygen, a lot of them are methan methanogens, which in a way converts CO2 into methane. Um, in a rice field, you have the water and you have all the soil at the bottom just sitting there. You have a lot of bacteria that is getting no oxygen because this water is stagnant. And sometimes you see bubbles coming up from the soil, and those are the bacteria that are producing the methane. Uh, in environmental engineering, uh, you can actually gather this bacteria and put it in a, an aerobic bioreactor and you can actually create energy because methane is actually a very good source of energy. And um, that's actually one of the ways to manage and to reduce emissions is by collecting this methane that's being emitted into the atmosphere and producing energy. But anyway, that's just like an interesting fact. Um, I don't know if people, I got more, more people confused by it. <laughs> but um, anyway, another way to reduce emissions is with livestock management by adjusting feeding practices and other management methods to reduce the amount of methane resulting from entire fermentation. In a way, don't feed animals too much because the more you feed animals, the more they poop. I think a lot of times you are over, or farmers do overfeed animals. Um, and you, I mean, you cannot starve animals and that's not the whole point. It's for you to feed them the right amount. Um, and that's what it says. Um, and also, it, you, that way you increase productivity, you don't spend as much money on food, and um, you don't emit as much. And also controlling manure or poop. Uh, sometimes people just leave the manure outside, and even though that sounds like it's not bad for the environment, it actually it very much is because of that methane. And also the anaerobic bacteria that gets piled up in that in that manure. Uh, sometimes it says handling manure this is very interesting, I think, as an environmental engineer. Handling manure is a solid depositing in a pasture rather than storing it in a liquid based system, such as a lagoon. A lot of people put manure in a lagoon, and from that lagoon, there is a lot of runoff also. So it's not just about air pollution, it's about running water that goes down into the river, and you do not want runoff from a manure lagoon in your main river that people are later drinking water from. Um, another way is to, by, to store manure in anaerobic containment and that we maximize methane production and capturing it as I previously mentioned to you guys. 
Um, this is a very good way, in fact, we're in a, an organization that I'm part of, Engineers Without Borders. They're doing this, they're collecting manure and putting it in a container to collect that methane and taking it to developing countries that have no source of energy um, to use that methane from basically their own poop uh, to create energy. And then, yeah, so an, uh, an interesting, so I just talked mainly about uh, greenhouse gases and how pollution from agriculture affects climate. But I have a, I guess, a field example of how pollution affects health. Oh, no. One second. Oh, well, before that, before that, we're going to say this. The 10, the 10 top countries with the largest agricultural emissions in 2011 were China, obviously, because China is massive, Brazil, the US, India, Indonesia, the Russian Federation, Congo, the uh, DRC, uh, Argentina, Myanmar, and Pakistan. Together, all those countries have contributed to 51% of global agricultural emissions. Um, and China, Brazil, and the United States were way on top of that, of that, of that list. Um, so speaking from my, I mean, I'm not from California, but I'm going to speak from a California standpoint, because California is um, a big state, a very important state in the production, the production of fruits and vegetables and overall agriculture. California produces a sizable majority of many American fruits, vegetables and nuts. And this is our just interesting facts that I'm throwing, it, throwing out there. 99% of artichokes, 99% of walnuts, 97% of kiwis, 97% of plums, 95% of celery, 95% of garlic, 89% of cauliflower, many fruits. California is at the, at the uh, lead when it comes to uh, the United States consumption. And one of the reasons why that is because we have good soil, we have good climate. In fact, no other state, even a combination of states, can match California, California's outputs per acre. So California supply will, of, of all these products in the United States will dip and it wouldn't be able, I mean, you wouldn't be able to grow this anywhere else in, in the US. So the reason why I'm saying this is not because I'm just proud of California and happy to be in California. But the reason why I'm saying this is because California does get a lot of its pollution from agriculture, and not so much here in the LA area, but in the Central Valley. The Central Valley of California, I don't know, if you just can, for those that can't see the map, I'm sorry, but I show a great photo of the state of California. There is a massive valley in the center of the state, which gets all its waters from the mountains. Uh, and it has great climate, very great climate, and most of the agriculture happens in that valley because a large part of the state inland is desert, and in the coastal regions, you don't get the water that the Central Valley does. So it um, happens to be that that Central Valley is also, in fact, the most polluted place in the United States. There's a city there called Bakersfield that is, it surpasses Los Angeles uh, in air pollution um, by a lot, uh, especially when it comes to PM um, particulate matter pollution. And um, so this is a big issue. And they said that the, the reason why they thought that air pollution here was so badly is because of burning, like I previously said, people thought that, that was a big issue. And this was, these are old uh, statistics. Uh, in, in fact, yes, the region's agriculture is responsible for a large... Somebody is on the line. All right. Um, but yeah, so agriculture really does affect this region. And one of the main reasons why that is, and this is a very misunderstood, um, a very misunderstood fact, is that there's ammonia. Ammonia, or NH3, comes from also cow poop. And it's an unple unpleasant odor that is actually not harmful for humans directly, but when this uh, compound mixes with other uh, compounds, um, it can 
add to smog and it can become very or harmful for humans. So they were saying the problems with farms is ammonia from fertilizer and animal waste that combines with sulfates and coal fire power plants and nitrates from car exhaust to form the soot particles that are the big air pollution killers. In the US, Northeast, and all of Europe, Russia, Japan, and South Korea, agriculture is the number one cause of uh, soot and smog deaths, according to this study that was published in recently in September of 2015. I will send you guys the link to this study, but it's really interesting and it was published in Nature and it's very reliable. So yeah, it shows you how shocking and how serious of an issue this is. So air pollution from agriculture doesn't just affect climate, it affects health. And in fact, there is a word for air pollution from agriculture that affects health. And I wanted to teach you guys this. Um, it's called SMIT, uh, which is a combination of smog and you know what. So this is something that not many people know about, but in academia, especially professors and scientists, they use this pretty often when they refer to agricultural emissions mixed with urban emissions. And interestingly enough, um, there is a lot of that, those emissions or that smit here in Riverside because we get all the pollution from Los Angeles and then we have cows that kind of halfway between Los Angeles and us. So we get smit all the time. And then I don't know if Sarah is online. Is Sarah Griffin online? Hello. Hello, Pedro. Yes. How's it going? Uh, hi. I, I, on my way home. Oh, okay. I'm on the phone. Oh, okay. Did I miss uh, Sanjay? Sorry, what? Did I miss Sanjay? You did. You did. He talked. He gave me speech. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry that I missed it. Oh, no worries. Oh. No worries. Uh, I, I send out his presentation to everybody, so everybody has it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, uh, so you can, uh, what's that noise? Oh, that was my car, I'm sorry. I just turned it on. Hello? That sorry, that was my car, I just turned it on. Oh, okay. Hello? Hello? Oh, okay, no worries. So, so do you want me to present your, your presentation? Hello? Sarah? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Uh, would you like me to Hello? present your presentation? Or... Oh, well, Hello? which can, one would you like me to can, do first? You... Which one um, would you like me just to do the, first? What's the beef with agriculture? What's the beef with agriculture air pollution? Um, I have the slides up. Um, I can just go ahead and... Uh, are you sure you, you can do it driving? <laughs> um, everything else has been discussed? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, okay. it's okay. I can... It's, it's, is, it, is it too difficult? Or, I mean, I can do it. It's basically the same thing or similar, I well, guess. I'm 20 minutes away from my house. Um, okay, um, go ahead and I'll, I'll, I'll present something different. Okay, and if not, if, I mean, you're more than welcome to present my project. Um, if you want to give me 20 minutes, I can at least do the best practices. No. Uh, um, uh, you know what? I'll, I'll present about about uh, COP twenty one, the basics of it, and I think twenty minutes. Wait, what? Julie, do you say something? Oh, I was just saying. Um, do you mind if I jump in? I'm not sure if it's um me or um if it's your side, Pedro. The connection is a little bit um weak, but um if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have some material um regarding COP twenty one in Paris to talk about. 
and that mm -hmm. should give Sarah plenty of time to um, get home and then share her presentations with us afterwards. Yep. That's a good idea. Okay. Yes. Yes. 21. yes. So wait, can you, can you guys hear me though or no? No. Like, yeah, working better. All right. Do you I'm guys hear me? Turn off, I'm going to um, let you go and then I'll call you in 20 minutes once I get home. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye-bye. See you soon. Uh, do you guys hear me when I, when I presented though or no? Okay. All right. All right. So yeah, let's skip. We just take this easy and slow. We're going to skip her presentation. That's hers too. That's her. Well, okay. And let me find this is entitled. One second. This is going to talk about COP because a lot of people hear about it, but they don't know more or less where it is. So while we wait for Julia, can anybody hear me okay? If you, if you can't hear me, just start making movements or something. Um, okay, so COP21, uh, we've heard on the news, you know, the climate summit in Paris, what's going on in Paris. I mean, I feel like with what happened um, with the terrorist attacks, it kind of got, the media was very much on it, on, on COP21, but as the, you know, uh, the terrorist attacks happened, the media put its focus on terrorist attacks, which I mean, that's completely understandable. So I feel like people lo lost a lot of track towards this um, very important summit, but um, it still hasn't happened. So hopefully the media will pick up. <laughs> um, it's happening in about six days from now. So I'm really hoping that, that the media picks up because this, this will be very important, not just for uh, politicians in the UN, but also for us as people and world citizens and our children. So it's, I have a base or I guess a simple explanation. I apologize if I have a lot of text. I just wanted, because a lot of people aren't able to, to be on the skull. So I just put all the text on there. Um, and also if, you, if I get cut off, my um, noise gets cut off, you can always read it. But um, basically, COP21, the reason why it's called 21 is because this is the 21st of a series of meetings of all these different nations. Um, so the international political response to climate change began in Rio Earth Summit in 1992. The Rio Convention, I don't know, the, uh, many times they have this Rio, what is it, 11, I forget the number, but it's when, when, when they refer to environmental affairs uh, in the UNEP, they refer to this Rio convention all the time because it was the, the first political response that happened in 1992. And this included the adoption of the UN framework on climate change, UNFCCC, and this convention set a framework of action aimed at establishing atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Uh, this was successful in a way, but obviously it wasn't as successful as everybody would have liked to, uh, because with climate change, there is so much political turmoil that happens. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's very unfortunate that climate, or I guess the science of climate, in, in a way, let me change that. It's very sad that politicians use the science of climate and the science period for their own affairs and for their own interests um, in polls and, and politics, because this is a very serious issue. And a lot of people refuse to believe it not because of they don't believe the science, but just because they don't trust the politicians. So this is a very bad thing that hopefully, you know, the world's evolving and people are starting to realize that, yeah, it really is a serious issue. But there is quite a lot of people that still don't believe it is because of politics. 
So yeah, the main objectives of COP, of this specific meeting in Paris, is to review the convention's implementation because obviously it wasn't as successful as it should have been. Therefore, they're reviewing that. Um, the first COP took place in Berlin, 1995. A significant meeting since Berlin that have included COP3 in Kyoto, um, which you guys know Kyoto Protocol was very famous and it was very important. And COP11, uh, where, the, where the Montreal Action Plan was conducted, COP15 in Copenhagen, um, where there was an agreement to success uh, Kyoto Protocol, and which was not realized, sadly. And then COP17 in Durban, where the Green, Clean, the Green Climate Fund was created. So now 2015, COP21 is known as the 2015 Paris Climate Conference. And it will be the first time in over 20 years of UN negotiation aimed to achieve a legally binding and universal agreement on climate. So very similar to, I guess, Kyoto Protocol. And the aim of that is to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius. There is a video actually that I would like to share. Um, Julene, do you know if I can share a video through this and also share the audio? Julene is gone. Julene. Well, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> There is a video that I really want to share. And the way, uh, I know I have a lot of, a lot of unread emails. Um, um, climate. You know what, I have it on my Facebook. Tell me if you can hear the video. Sorry, I'm showing my Facebook. I apologize. This is the only way I'm gonna get to the video. Tell me if you hear. If it loads. Can you hear? Yeah, okay. Let me make it big. Stephen Harper. Dear President Jacob Zuma. Dear Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Dear World Leaders. We all know that the climate crisis is here. We can see it all around us. We are all affected by it. We would do something about it. In fact, some of us already are. In our businesses, now it's your turn. As our leaders, as the ones who are filled with power, the power to represent the people. To represent me and me. And me. And all three of us. Don't forget me. Please listen. Listen to the land. Listen to the ocean. Listen to the science. This is summer 2015. You will be right here in Paris at the UN Climate Change Conference. Actually, we have some demands. We demand that you cooperate with one another. We demand that you send a message to pollutants. Stop using fossil fuels. Now is the time. The time for you to act. We need to make long-term commitments. Commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then you know. The world will be a better place instantly. I want you to look after my future. What's riding on YouTube, sir? Thanks for listening. So anyway, that's a pretty cool video. Hopefully politicians watch it. Because it doesn't really do any good if just us watch it. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, it's, it's a very important agreement. Um, and the aim of that is to keep global warming below two degrees Celsius. Because if it goes above two degrees Celsius, the results 
um, and consequences are going to be catastrophic, as you guys know. The, the sea level is going to increase, drought, um, floods, many, I mean, there's, there's a long list of things, of bad consequences that could happen if it goes over two degrees Celsius. It doesn't seem like much, but it'll be big. So this is a list of countries, and this is just CO2 emissions. Again, as I previously mentioned, there's methane, there is uh, NOx that also glow, um, um, warms the atmosphere indirectly through ozone. The big thing, the big, I guess, attention is in CO2, but it's not just CO2. The reason why CO2 is so big in climate is because CO2 has a long life. So, for example, methane um, and uh, N2O has a lot, long, a lot higher potential for a long, higher potential for warming. However, it doesn't last as long in, in the atmosphere. Um, CO2 lasts for many, 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 many years, and that's why that's the biggest concern. And the main emitters of CO2 are China, United States, the European Union, India, Russian Federation, and then it goes on from there. Some countries, as you can see in this chart, there, um, there's been some, some improvements. Um, if you look at uh, from 1990 to 2012, uh, if you see China, for example, and again, I'm sorry, I always bully China, but China just needs to do something about their emissions. Uh, China, which is the first one on the list, um, has, the lo has relatively low emissions by comparison to the United States or the European Union, but the CO2 emissions in 2012 has skyrocketed, skyrocketed, and not just overall as a country, but per capita as well. Um, there is a lot of discussions now be, that are being done or a lot of discussion that is going on between countries um, and they want to put a carbon tax on China. If they do, that's going to be really, it's going to be very interesting. It's gonna, if they put a carbon tax on China, uh, given their situation on you know, development, because they're still developing, it's a some some cities, I mean, the cities are are developed, but there's parts of China that are very much third world country. If on top of their development, they give them um, a carbon tax, it's going to be really interesting how things are going to come out. The United States is not out of the game, obviously. Uh, it increased, but not as much as China. And in fact, the per capita CO2 um, emissions has decreased. Um, India, I mean. It, it doesn't have a comparison with China and the United States. And the European Union actually has, done, has decreased their CO2 emissions, which is very good, and that's something the European Union should be proud of. It's still really high, but um, it, 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 it decreased. So at least it's on its way down versus its way up. But if you look, I mean, some, some of the, the countries that emit less are hard to see. But for the most part, developing countries are emitting more over time versus developed, developed countries that were really developed in 1990, they're actually on their way down. So this is a big, a big question in developing countries is whether these developing countries can actually afford to implement CO2 reduction technologies because a lot of them don't have the money to do that. In the US we do, in Europe we do, but a lot of developing, developing countries don't. And that's why they want to tax, but again, it's hard to tax developing, developing countries. It's a, it's a complicated issue. So I'm very excited to see, this is, this is, going, to be, this is going to be discussed at um, COP21. So I'm very excited to see what's the output on that. Um, the impact of climate change on human health specifically, because sometimes I, I, I just recently went to a talk on climate change and they were saying how people can't relate to climate change. When you speak about climate change, they always show you the polar, the polar bears. But then you don't relate to polar bears. You don't live near polar bears. You don't know anything that goes on in the, in the North Pole. So when you relate climate change to health, um, there is quite a lot of you know, implications that uh, revolve health. Uh, so, you, so sometimes when it's hard, when 
you talk to people that don't believe in climate change and you tell them what the consequences are going to be in their own life, um, sometimes they change. They change their, their, their perspective. So there's going to be a lot of heat related uh, illnesses, injuries, asthma because of air pollution. As you see, air pollution is going to increase. Uh, changes in vector ecology, a lot of diseases are going to go out of proportion. Allergies, uh, water quality impacts, water and food supply impact, that's a big one. And of course, environmental regulation. Um, I have a question. What? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, I took a deal with the So basically, you were talking about countries are thinking of putting taxes on carbon emissions on China. Under which organization or body can they do it? Like under the United Nations or which body? Wait, wait. Could you could you repeat that? I can hear you. Uh, are you yeah. on? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can't hear you very well. Oh. Okay. What should I do? Can you hear me now? Yeah, better. Okay. So basically, I wanted to ask, like, which body or organization like can implement that tax on China to reduce the carbon emission, like United Nations or which other international body can actually be implemented? The UN. If the UN decides to tax China, China has to pay the tax. It's, it's a UN. The UN is, I guess, in a way above other nations. It's just, is it's very complicated. to do that? Is it, is it legal? Is I, there any like, apart from United Nations, because we have seen that United Nations does not seem to be binding on countries when, it, when the countries have like, decided. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'm very interested in seeing what's going to happen because it's, I'm, I heard that, I heard, because I heard politicians say that. I heard people from the European Union and from the United States pushing towards that tax in China. But then I'm like, how are they going to do that? How is that going to work? How are they going to be able to? And again, you can't do that to a developing country in a way. Uh, it's, I don't know. I don't know. It, if they do do it, it's going to be really interesting. I don't know how the relations between China and other countries are going to change if they do implement that tax. It's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. Um, so we'll see what that goes. Yeah, sorry. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, so I, I, I know I've heard in the past that in previous agreements, uh, maybe Pedro, you, you've heard of this too, that in previous agreements, some countries, either you know, developing countries who needed or who had, you know, high uh, carbon emissions due to economic growth as their developing countries, or countries that just were excessive beyond the threshold set by regulations of the UN, that there was like trading of carbon emissions, that essentially one country could buy the carbon emissions of another to avoid having to pay taxes. Did you hear about this? No, I didn't, I didn't hear about it. Yes, yeah, so I think it was a plan of in, maybe in the 90s where um, essentially, you know, if China had too high uh, carbon emissions, someone else could buy th that amount of emissions to avoid uh, them from having to pay certain debts or, you know, but I think, you know, in this new plan, they're probably going to try to avoid that. Uh, and, and I think the, the rationale was that the effect that it has on the climate, I mean, it's so interesting because climate change is not sort of limited by national boundaries. No, right. It's affecting it's the global. climate is it's, it's global, right? So uh, just because yeah. you have pollution in one area, it might affect it just as much in LA as it affects it in, you know, in Europe. So. It's just hard to tell because, again, I'm not on one side or the other. I can see why being putting a tax on it would do something, but I can also see how it would. Yeah. Yeah. Either way, it'd be very hard to keep people accountable. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Okay. By the way, I just wanted to let you know, I, I took a photo of us just to put it on the, on, the, um, on the website saying, oh, this is our forum in a way. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share with, with everybody that, you know, there's people that showed up and all that stuff. But with, with CO2, again, it's such a big political, big mess in a way. So, it, so it's sad. Um, see, who is, is, there, is there anybody? Reina, Julian, Alejandra. Oh, Alejandra. 
How's it going? Hey. Um, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Muhammad, uh, you're you're from Pakistan. Where are you from? Yes, I'm from Pakistan. Pakistan. So how is I know Pakistan does also emit some CO2, and in a way, Pakistan is still in the process of developing. So is there are being is there like some negotiation being done in Pakistan to reduce CO2 at a local level, at a I guess state level, or is it most difficult? I don't see any developments in this regard because. Um, Forget about CO2, even the rate with which glaciers are melting in Pakistan, especially in the Karakoram region, because we are talking about environmental concerns in general. So I don't see the government doing anything in this regard. Even the, the speed at which water is being polluted, the drinking water, the glaciers are melting. I don't see any development in terms of, I would not think that yeah. they are doing anything. Good. Yeah, it's hard. It's, and in a way, I think what needs to happen with CO2 is collaboration. There's countries that have a lot of money and a lot of resources. There's countries that don't have resources. So there's going to there's gonna be more collaboration. And the same thing with air pollution. Um, if one country is living in basic toxic uh, on a daily basis and that air pollution moves to another country, there needs to be a collaboration. Even though it is that one country that, that polluted, I feel like there needs to be more more talking and more, I guess, helping in a way versus, oh, tax. There you go. You work, now, now, now you're gonna pay money. So it's a little bit. It's interesting to see, but I'm sure Pakistan. So even in the cities, there's no saying don't drive your car as much. There's nothing, nothing environmentally related in the cities. Like no. No education. There are, like in the cities, for example, or even in general, there are some regulations, like um, the kind of the particular, like previously we used to use a lot of CNG, uh, which is, um, I don't know what, what the full form of this application is, but it's like a gas that is, um, that is not in, uh, uh, that is not in large supply. So we used to uh, use it a lot. But now they have put uh, limits on it, the limits to which you can use it, and also the kind of engines that you have to use. There are less, um, and there will be a fine. There will be fines on you if you use them. So these kind of measures, but I don't think they are going to be that effective, if, because if factories are not being controlled, then these are just nominal measures. Yeah, and that's in a way, it's hard. I. Um, some of you guys don't know, I uh, took part of a UNEP debate. Uh, the UNEP met I think, uh, three weeks ago in, in Nairobi to discuss air pollution. It was, the whole thing was about air pollution. They had all the different representatives from each country and each one of them gave us like a spiel of their own you know, region and how air pollution was in, in their region. And a lot of politicians were saying, yeah, it's really bad. Yeah, it's really bad, but yeah, the air is dirty. We have a lot of emissions, <laughs> but nobody said, or very few people said, we're doing this to fix it. So that's in a way sad, um, but that's kind of, that's how I guess these meetings go. But okay, I'll keep going because Sarah's probably gonna get home very soon. And I have a few more slides on, on, on COP. Um, and another thing, because a lot of people, when you tell them that there's global warming um, happening, like, oh, but yesterday was cold. Or no, yesterday, or it, like, like the East Coast. It snowed a lot in the East Coast, and the temperature was really cold last year. So it's obvious it's global uh, cooling. It's not global warming. But you got to look at the overall you know, global temperature, not just regional. And then also, for you to see the impacts of CO2 on, on the Earth, you have to wait many, many, many years. And I think it's very interesting. Like, if you look at this, at this, um, at this figure, you see how the CO2 emissions peak. So we're at the top of that peak. And assuming that peak doesn't keep increasing, that, this is how it's going to happen. So then 
the CO2 stabilization is going to happen in 100 to 300 years. Then the temperature is going to increase after that, and it'll establish, um, it'll stabilize after a few centuries. And then the sea level rise and expansion, that's all going to happen in thousands of years. So I said, oh, yeah, well, I didn't see the beach getting smaller. It's like, no, 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 it's going to happen over thousands of years. So it's not, you're not, not going to suffer the consequences, and neither are your children. But generations after that will. So if you care about your generations, then you got to care about that. And that's why I think the video that they did was great to have children because, um, you know, it's, it's important to care about the future generations. Um, this, is, this is just PPM. Uh, the, the, this is the um, concentrations of CO2, methane, and uh, nitrous oxides. So as I told you, methane is actually a lot more warming. It has a higher warming potential. And that methane is about, hang on, let me double check my number, but methane is about 30 times warming potential of CO2. Um, one second, let me get this. Okay, yeah, so, so um, yeah, methane has about 34 times uh, the uh, warming potential of CO2. And N2O has about 298 times the, um, the warming potential of CO2. So people are putting a lot of, I guess, effort and a lot of attention on CO2, but really methane and, and N2O are really warming. They just don't last as long in the atmosphere. So um, Sarah is here. I have one more slide, and then Sarah, you can take over. <laughs> um, so they, okay. So what I'm saying is, there is this thing called short-lived, short-lived climate pollutants that people are not aware about, and there is a uh, initiative carried upon by the United Nations called the Clean Air Coalition which basically uses or educates people about the short-lived climate pollutants. Because even though they're not as famous as CO2, they are 30 times, almost 300 times uh, more warming, or they have a higher warming, warming potential than, um, than carbon dioxide. So that is these. It's black carbon, methane, tropospheric ozone and hydrofluorocarbons. Um, so see, for example, methane lasts for 12 years. I think CO2 is about 100. Black carbon doesn't last as long. Tropos trop tropospheric ozone doesn't last as long. It only lasts weeks. And then hydrofluorocarbons is 15 years. Um, actually, look, carbon dioxide up to 25% more than 1,000 years. So yeah, we should care about CO2, but we should care about the short-lived climate pollutants as well. Um, and a lot of them come from agriculture. And with that, I'll let Sarah take over. Unmute yourself. Hello? Yep, you're here. Okay. Yep, I'm here. Oh, could you uh, move the slide? Yep. Mind? Thank you, Pedro. Sorry. All right, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I will be presenting um, the presentation called What's the Beef with Agricultural Air Pollution? And the specific subject matter would be uh, beef cattle as well as uh, dairy cattle. I'm sorry, could you move it to the next slide? Oops, sorry, was that me? Sorry, did I ruin it?
Dara, do you have this PowerPoint on your computer? Um, no, right now I'm actually um, on my iPad. Oh, I see. Okay, then go ahead. I was just wondering. Sorry, I didn't know if I had um, messed something up on his end. I don't know what's not working. Okay. Okay, um, I can see if I can pull it up on my phone. Wait, one sec, let me leave. Um, and we can all take this opportunity if anyone has any questions that they're kind of formulating, um, be sure to save them. And I'm sure that Sarah and Pedro will open it up to discussion or question and answer. So feel free to jump in at that point um, with any thoughts, even if it's just a reaction to what was shared today. It doesn't have to be an actual question. Um, I definitely encourage you all to share that. Guys? Yes. Okay. I don't know what the heck happened. My computer froze. Can you see? Oh, I, I need to share screen first, huh? My computer froze. What the heck is happening? Okay. Let's try it one more time. Where's my PowerPoint? All right. I'm going to share a screen. Let's see if this works. Share screen. Okay. Is it working now? It's not letting me do it full screen. Do you mind just doing it like this? That's fine. Okay, let's just do it like this. I don't know what's going on. Hello, Sarah? Connections between classes. Oof. Sarah, okay, we, we, we lost you for a little bit. Are you there? Can you guys hear me or no? Yeah, so Hello? it's Sarah? Yes. Okay, now, now you're good. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so tonight I will be talking about uh, the connections between livestock and greenhouse gases, which are extremely um, harmful uh, to planet Earth. And um, I will be highlighting um, the specific uh, ruminant animals, which actually are the ones through their no fault of their own um, when it comes to processing grains uh, one aspect of them processing grains is actually uh, fermenting grains which is similar to uh, grapes turning into wine and as um, like an aftermath of that process methane gas is created and then when the cows belch that methane gas then leaves their body and is then entered into um, our, our air and then um, the greenhouse gases um, unfortunately are then um, not allowed to escape um, the atmosphere and that's what's creating us to um, heat up and have uh, global warming and uh, let me see here and what um, I was able to find out is that 14.5% of those greenhouse gases um, actually come from livestock, livestock and um, beef and dairy cattle make 
picked up 65% of that 14.5%. And uh, this uh, beef and dairy cattle industry um, is also responsible for um, deforestation, which contributes to um, carbon dioxide. And for an annual total, that comes to 340 million tons. And also livestock manure also releases nitrogen oxide. So in total, you have three seriously dangerous gases that are being released just because of the beef and dairy cattle industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure if you want to watch videos or not during the forum, forum or if we can even do that, but the science news uh, video goes into really great um, explanation into uh, the, um, the cow processing of methane gas. And also the CNN article called Cows Are the New SUVs um, talks about um, uh, farms, which are uh, farmers who are in the beef and dairy cattle business who don't really see the difference that, you know, cows make on the environment. So it's kind of good to get their perspective. So mm -hmm. I definitely encourage you to read that article. So Pedro, if you want to go to the next slide, that would be great. Thanks. All right. And these are two uh, pictures. First of all, the one on the left shows the cow like I had previously discussed about how it takes in the grains how in its stomach processes the grains into the specific um, uh, methane gas process, as well as how um, it, sorry, as well as how it processes it into manure and the fertilization where we have um, uh, harmful gases coming out of the cow. And then we have on the right, uh, the carbon footprint of uh, specific ruminant animals. So we have, I believe, over here on the left, and I'm sorry, my font, my screen's really tiny, so I can't really see. Pedro, does that say um, beef over there on the left for the carbon footprint? Uh, the right in the left column. No, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, I can, okay. yeah, beef. Beef. So that has the highest carbon footprint. Huh. And Look I think this. that's at 65% is where I read. The seafood, interesting. Mm hmm Yes, and this came straight out of that um, cows are the new SUVs article that I had mentioned beforehand. Huh, interesting. I thought pork, I, I would have thought pork was higher than sheep, but sheep apparently is very high. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Because of cotton, I'm guessing, or not, not cotton, but wool. I don't know. That's something to certainly look into. Definitely. Oh, huh, interesting. Cool. Yeah. And I think that's really great about these forums is that, you know, something that we learn will eventually spiral into new questions. Yeah, definitely. New research opportunities for everyone. Definitely. Cool. And if you guys see, do you guys see the right here in the cow it says methanogens? Those are the bacteria that also make methane in the rice fields. Like at the bottom of the rice fields, they also have methanogens. And interestingly enough, there is a lot of methane that is being emitted from rice fields and from stagnant water. So how are they solving that issue? How they're solving it? Um, yeah, so that's a, that was part of what oh, you I'm made. sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Says, it said, um, uh, oh yeah, so a way to do that is by storing that methane some in some because these rice fields are very large, right? But if you can store that methane, you can use that methane for energy because energy, uh, sorry, methane you can actually actually use it as an energy source. Um, in fact, I have a lot of anaerobic bio bioreactors that they're called, and they use just manure and I guess organics to produce uh, methane to later convert into energy. Yeah. But, um, and then they said draining, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but specifically for, for rice soils, 
-hmm. What you gotta do is to drain the water from wetland rice soils during the growing season. That's a way to reduce it. Very Instead of leaving it there. Because it's, okay. it, when the water is stagnant, it's at the bottom. And sometimes you see the bubbles on, the, on these rice fields. So yeah, it's interesting. And they haven't created some kind of system that would kind of circulate that water using that energy that... I don't, I don't think so. I think it would use a lot of energy too. <laughs> That's the thing is, is that using, they want to keep agriculture in a way that it's not too costly. So it doesn't cost money to just leave the water there. And if they do have to recirculation and there's no regulation saying you have to do that. Once you implement regulations, then you have to do it. But I doubt they're going to put, put a, a regulation on rice fields. They probably will tell them you have to drain them. And if you don't drain them, you're, you get fined. Very interesting. Yeah. Learn something new each and every day. Yeah, yeah. So when you see a rice field, just think how polluting that rice field is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's really, really interesting. I right, see. So, so you want to move to the next one? Uh, yes, please. All right. I kind of feel like this is the most entertaining slide of all of them. Um, so while, <laughs> when I was doing this research, I didn't realize, you know, the hidden cost of hamburgers. And I'm not sure, as I mentioned before, if you wanted to watch a video, but I highly recommend watching both of these videos down here. Uh, the one with the cow is actually called the hidden cost of hamburgers and it'll actually go into great detail about um, how many cows are actually in the United States and I believe in the video it says upwards of 88 million cows just in the United States but I um, actually read today that it's closer to 90 million in circulation and that's for beef and dairy cows to keep up with our growing demands. And they also said that because um, China, um, their, their residents are um, entering into really high incomes, this number will uh, continue to grow just because those consumers uh, want to have more of a protein rich lifestyle. And I also learned that even though um, China is very um, highly populated. The United States um, actually eats twice as much meat as China, but I definitely believe that these numbers will be uh, reversing very soon. And I also realized that the production of one hamburger actually releases the same amount of greenhouse gas as if you were to drive 10 miles and a 3,000 pound car. So when you go to, let's say McDonald's, think about that the next time. <laughs> and also, since we are thinking about the environmental impacts, it also takes 1,000 gallons of water just to create that half pound hamburger, which is a very, um, very sad thing to think about. And then I, don't believe there's really any way to stop um, the beef industry just because, you know, first of all, it's a booming industry. It's valued at $44 billion worldwide. Um, there's really nothing to stop it. I think it's just raising awareness about it. I'm sorry, you were saying something, Pedro? There you go. There is a there is a documentary called Cowspiracy, which has a little bias here and there, but for the most part, it's pretty accurate. And I recommend you watch it. It's on Netflix. Those who have access to Netflix, sorry, Mohammed, I don't know if Netflix is in Pakistan, but I mean, if if if, if, if you can find it on YouTube, it's a very interesting documentary. But uh, interestingly enough, you were saying about greenhouse gases um, in the LA area. I mean, the, the main source of PM is obviously the Port of Los Angeles and all that stuff. But one of the higher emitters of PM, PM is particulate matter or the particulates that go inside your lungs, is actually um, fast food restaurants. 
Hmm. So it's it's a very polluting source, um, and there's a lot of food um, studies being done on burgers to see how many particles come out. And it's really interesting. And interestingly enough, the more fat, so if you order something light, like lean meat, doesn't pollute as much as when you have greasy burgers. So that's yes. As well. And you also have to think about uh, the de deforestation that is uh, being created, especially in uh, countries like Brazil, where the Amazon rainforest is being destroyed as we speak uh, due to uh, cattle ranches. And uh, these trees are there to obviously give us energy and uh, we through that deforestation is just uh, clogging that area and eventually uh, the rest of the planet with uh, with carbon there's no way to actually you know get any oxygen and I think that's eventually going to be really harmful to us oh definitely Oh, yeah, it's it's a it's a big source. I uh, you missed this um, statistic, but actually, agriculture makes up uh, for one third of anthropogenic anthropogenic meaning coming from humans uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But that is from rice field. It's all agriculture, both crops and animals. One third, a lot. Mm -hmm. So definitely need to be addressed. Do you have more slides? Yeah. Yes, one more after this. Oh, this is the, the, um, what do you call it, the um, videos? Um, yes, I have a few videos on this slide, as well as a few articles. And these were just um, different organizations and different research studies where they are trying to channel the methane gas that is being um, admitted into the um, atmosphere. And one way of doing that is actually um, extracting the methane from the cows themselves from backpacks. Mm -hmm. um, and that was originally happening in Argentina. Um, I don't believe they were getting the results that they wanted. So that's no longer an ongoing project. But I just thought it was interesting that, you know, they're coming up with some creative ways to, you know, make the environment healthier for us. There are also organizations like the Strauss Family Creamery that uses that methane gas to power um, yes. their ice cream making farm. That's cool. And then, yeah. And then there's also uh, the Green Mountain Dairy, which is a dairy farm in Vermont that actually sells their, uh, their, met their methane gas uh, electricity to uh, community members and the community members are actually willing to pay the increased fee for the electricity because it ultimately is helping the environment mm -hmm. and then I also uh, wanted to inform you about the Frackenburger which is actually a lab cultured meat where they're actually helping hoping that it'll actually help with the future global demands of the beef industry just as i mentioned before that um, china was growing to uh, be entering into the beef industry and they were hoping to not have to raise any more cows and not have to uh, contribute to any more deforestation and then lastly um, this group called project clean cow had created uh, special substances um, to add to the cow feed to the grains and they said uh, their recent study that they were able to reduce those methane gas emissions by 30 percent and this was a recent study actually conducted by uh, Pennsylvania State University um, so if you were to go to the methane inhibitor link that would take you directly to an article which would take you to the study itself Oh, very cool. Very, very cool. And just to add up on the uh, Green Mountain and I guess the Strauss Family Creamery, uh, my, the, the city of Riverside won an award for selling their grease. So 
the grease from the restaurants because a lot of times they get that grease that you can't use for anything else. Yes. Uh, which is also very polluting. Uh, to actually add it to these bioreactors where, where they produce that, that methane, when you add grease, you add more food for these uh, bacteria to eat. And when they have the grease, they produce more methane. And the more methane, the more energy, if you don't let it escape, obviously. And um, yeah, it's actually a very good... Um, in fact, UC San Diego um, has a massive massive um, methane producer, basically, like a massive bioreactor. And they, um, they power, like, I don't know how many buildings without methane. Oh my goodness. It's really cool. Like you go there and they have this, it's, it's huge. It's like this building basically with a bunch of poop in it um, that they use to, to make energy. And uh, it's super, really interesting. Um, That's yeah. great. And I think, is this your last slide? Yeah. No, I, mean, I think that's your. Yeah, I just have a couple, a couple, um, a couple slides left uh, uh, with, with just summary and, and solutions. Um, it sucks that I can't make it big, but oh well. Okay, so just going back to summary, can you guys see it more or less? Can you guys see it? Yes. Oh. So, okay. Here I put the pollutants and whether it affects health or not and whether it affects climate or not. These are the pollutants that come from agriculture and why we should care about it. So let's just go over it real quick. Uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, comes from burning, from soil respiration, plant respiration, and biomass burning. Does it affect, does it affect health? Not but it affects climate and through climate it affects health because there's a you know i previously talked about the health implications about climate change uh then methane ch4 the source is cows 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 <laughs> they're manure <laughs> and obviously not not just cows but other animals that poop and all animals poop but for the most part cows poop by far the large the most amount um, and then also burning anaerobic aquatic processes like rice fields. Uh, does it affect health? No, but again, it affects climate and it has a very large warming potential, 34 times that of CO2. It is, doesn't last as long in the atmosphere as, as CO2, but it is very concerning because it's, it warms the atmosphere very fast in a way. So N2O, nitrous oxide, comes from manure, fertilizers, and cows. Does it affect health? No, but again, affects climate. In fact, it has a very high pot um, warming potential, 290 something, 98 times that of uh, CO2. And then ammonia, uh, ammonia, you missed it, Sarah, but I talked about ammonia and how it comes from cows mm -hmm. and how ammonia itself is not bad. Is Alejandra here? Alejandra, can you hear me? Because we were talking can about... Can you hear me? Yeah, is this Alejandra? I am here. Yeah. Okay, you're, you're on the phone, right? Yes, I am. Okay, cool. So, ammonia, remember I sent you that um, information about Denver having uh, agricultural emissions coming from the north into the city? Yes, I remember that. So, okay, so that, those emissions from the north, they're ammonia, and itself, ammonia itself is not harmful to the health, but when it mixes with urban pollution, it creates this thing called smit, which is a mixture between smog and shit from the cows, and it's actually very harmful for your health. In fact, there, there's been some studies that it's been even more dangerous than, um, regular smog. And interestingly enough, in a study that just came out very recently, another study that I sent you about, another study that was published in September, it says in the US Northeast, all of Europe, Russia, Japan, and South Korea, and I'm guessing Denver, I'm not 100%, but from the top, <laughs> yeah. um, agriculture is the number one cause of the soot and smog deaths, according to this study. And I think it's not because of smog, it's because of that smith. Yeah. 
And this That's interesting. Yeah, it is. And this, this ammonia is very misunderstood. It's, uh, there is very little information on ammonia emissions from agricultural sources. There's a lot of information on methane, on CO2, but ammonia is starting now to become a popular topic. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of studies being done on that. And that's, you know, the whole thing with Denver. And here in California, we have a big issue with that as well. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to about ammonia. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> and then PM, uh, particular matter comes from burning crops, dust, tractors, equipment, fertilizers. It affects health and it affects climate. And NOx, which also comes from burning crops, tractors, and other equipment, it affects health as it contributes to smog and it affects climate indirectly through the formation of ozone. Um, and then solutions, just quick solutions. How can we make the earth a better place? And what the purpose, the whole purpose of this uh, forum is to find solutions, right? It's not just to talk about how crappy our world is. Um, so solutions to this, I talked about it a little bit before, but I'm just gonna reiterate what it is. I can't see my slides, so I need my cheat sheets. Uh, okay, so solutions. One of the ways to solve this agricultural emissions is to change, obviously, the farming practices, moving from that conventional agriculture to um, organic or sustainable agriculture. Um, and also managing the crops in a way that not so much fertilizer is needed. Um, and that way also, you know, rotating the, the crops and planting crops at the same, in, you know, planting a diverse amount of crops versus planting one type of crop or monocropping. And also eating less meat. <laughs> I mean, really, if you eat less meat, there won't be as uh, high demand for meat. And as much as of a controversy that is, it is the truth. If you don't eat as much meat, if you become vegan, you will be helping the earth in a way, and not just the earth, but also your, yourself. Um, I have a hard time doing this. I love meat. <laughs> but I do know that if you're a true environmentalist, you need to stop eating meat because it is very detrimental. And really, even though, yeah, you can technically do it in a sustainable way, it's still, cows are going to poop. And methane is going to be emitted. So that is just, you know, that is just the reality. And also, just one of the ways to uh, mitigate methane is to collect it for energy. But I think the big, 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 big solution that nobody really ever thinks about, everybody's like, okay, let's become vegan, let's change the practice. The big solution, especially here in the United States, is to stop wasting food. Because the United States wastes, wastes an insane amount of food. Um, uh, by 2050, the world will need about 60% more calories per year in order to feed a projected 9 billion people. Cutting uh, the rate of global food loss and waste could help close this food gap. Because there's a big concern that the people are going to increase, but you can't grow anymore. Like there's the, the ground is saturated. We don't fit more cows. We don't fit more rice. But if you don't waste as much, then you'll be able to feed the extra people. Because in the, in the U.S., 24% 24, 24 of calories produced for people are never consumed. Um, 198 million uh, hectares used to produce food we don't eat. And that's like, as comparison, that's the size of Mexico. So the size of Mexico, full of food, people waste. And then about 1,600, I can't see this thing, $1,600 is the value of food thrown out by the average US family per year. That's a lot of money. You could buy an amazing Christmas present. So stop wasting food. And that's, that would be the main solution uh, to all of this. I mean, obviously, the other ones need to be considered, but stop wasting is the big thing. Sarah, 
I also have your smart goals and objectives. Do you want to share that real quick? Or do you, we have 10 minutes. Yes, I can talk about it if you'd like me to. Sure. I mean, we have 10 okay. minutes. There's three slides. Let's I can run it. through it. No problem. All right. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Sarah again. I'm also one of the Millennium uh, Fellows uh, working with Pedro on the Fair Air Coalition. And tonight I'm going to be uh, giving a best practices session on SMART goals and objectives. It's actually one of the lessons that uh, the Millennium Fellows actually learned about a few weeks ago. And I will be talking about the Guangdong Agricultural Pollution Control Project that the World Bank um, is currently sponsoring. And Pedro, will you please move it to the next slide? Thank okay. you. All right. And then using the SMART goals and objectives, I've been able to um, determine that for specific um, the project is saying by December 31st, 2019, China World Bank's the Guadong Agricultural Pollution Control Project will have reduced water pollutant releases from crop and livestock production in selected areas of Guangdong province by adopting the project promoted crop production or livestock waste management practices and technologies. So that's their um, who, what, and why uh, they're doing their project. Uh, for measurable, it's very easy to determine that their essential uh, metric is whether or not um, GAPCP's end targets, and there's a good half dozen of those targets, um, will be achieved by the end date of December 31st, 2019. Uh, for attainable, um, it is extremely crucial for the farmers to um, utilize the project promoted practices for the desired end targets. And since starting, I believe, um, in December 2013, they were able to show after a year that by utilizing quality fertilizers, that they were actually able. Um, to see a reduction in nutrient crop runoff. And one way that they are actually able to do that is that they've given all the farmers participating in this project um, special cards that is actually um, have been programmed to uh, give them the right amount of fertilizers for their specific um, measurements of land and uh, they've been allocated certain amounts of high quality fertilizers um, to apply to their um, agricultural plants. Um, Pedro, if you wouldn't mind switching to the next slide. All right, and then for relevant, uh, I was able to determine that by December 31st, 2019, Project managers and evalu evaluators will be able to determine success of this project by determining how many livestock waste management facilities. And one of the pillars for this project was actually making uh, two story, and they call it hotels for pigs. So that way, um, the second floor is where the actual pigs are, and they have a grading system between the second and first floor where uh, their droppings would fall to the first floor and then the farmers would be able to utilize the solids for fertilizing their land and then the um, the liquid they would then uh, go through a processing and a uh, solution to ultimately be able to utilize on their farms but also able to clean out uh, these livestock waste management facilities um, and then by the end of uh, 2019, their end target is to make 300 of these livestock waste management facilities because at the current time, any surrounding neighbors are actually experiencing really bad air quality because of the pigs being 
in there. So this is a way for uh, them to kind of flush out that smell from the pigs as well as uh, utilize, as we said, the droppings before and use it in um, a better way to grow these farms. And then I should have written uh, time bound here saying that these, these three deadlines are actually a way for the World Bank and for China to make certain that all their end targets are at least met. And then Pedro, that concludes my project. Oh, and I'm that's sorry. A, that's I'm really sorry. cool. These yeah. uh, two videos here at the end are actually from the World Bank from this Kwadong project. Um, if you would like uh, more information about the project, I would definitely recommend watching them. And the project itself is actually $200 million for it to be implemented over the course of this project. And it's actually one of four projects going on with a total of $520 million to um, put in place um, environmentally safe uh, programming. Cool, I like that big hotel. It's pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cool. All right. So that concludes like all the material. We have three minutes. If anybody wants to add anything, uh, please do so. In regards to agriculture, COP21, um, I believe the um, PowerPoint I sent you did not include the COP21 slides, but I'm more than happy to send that again to everybody. Uh, but yeah, anybody has any other questions? Everybody's just looking forward for Thanksgiving and either they're eating their faces off. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I'm excited. I've always loved things. I think it's my favorite American holiday. It's my favorite too. I'm looking forward to the parade. Oh, the parade. New York parade. Right? Yes, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Oh, that's right. They have to be there. That's cool. Yeah, I actually, I know people that wake up really early to watch that here in California. So let's watch the Macy's Parade. I'm like, I'm not waking up that early. <laughs> what would it be? Six o'clock in the morning? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're committed to that, to that Macy's Parade. <laughs> yes, that's dedication there. That's dedication. And then they play it like over the whole day too. I'm like, you don't have to. No, no, no. I want to watch it live. Okay. <laughs> you can watch it on YouTube later. Uh, <laughs> uh, any anybody has anything to add? So so Donovan, uh, Julene, uh, Donovan and I talked, and we feel like sometimes we could maybe hey, merge um, our like efforts since like his youth, like the youth campaign, 